Gamers, it's Monday. Let's get some modern action going. This time we've got some Death Shadow versus Golgari Birthing Ritual. It's kind of a hybrid-y, let's do some, you know, Yawgmoth shenanigans with Birthing Ritual, but we also have some reanimation strategies built in, um, so we'll see how that plays out for here. Death Shadow, one of my favorite old school decks, still alive and well, especially the Demir version that it is, and we've got the players that were nice enough to pull up their phone for life totals there so we've got that we've got of course our little banner down at the bottom here for you guys you know if you like the banner at the bottom compared to the top let me know maybe we'll do this more often with just the banners at the bottom i you know who, who knows there but uh we've got of course lots of action with our twice a week modern coverage that we're doing for you and this one's gonna be an interesting one because we have two newer players to modern newer players to magic and and kind of learning their decks grinding out trying to improve and get better so we might spend a little bit more time discussing uh alternative plays oh what if you did this instead of that and and you know we'll do some discussions around that uh in this series here but you know again we've got a lot more other matches to be able to show you in the near future like of course we've got some more amulet in the works we've got some more energy in the works here so lots of stuff in queue for you all to be able to enjoy but tamio i like this card a lot i've been playing it in def different builds uh the card's cool i mean it's it's not the most powerful flip planeswalker but the fact that you can just get card advantage off it is really helpful and really nice like get generating clues if it flips into the planeswalker you can be able to return an instant or sorcery from your graveyard like this it's got a lot of value so getting it out early on a turn one to follow it up is really nice wall of roots is kind of the ramp strategy that a golgari package is going to want to use things like um our delayed at halfling things like the wall roots your, your goal is to kind of ramp out into something scarier right get some quarter calling set it up we already have a young in hand we have one young wolf on hand so remember if you can be able to get two young wolves you get your yog moth and you can basically be able to draw a bunch of cards and try to uh, set yourself up for a nice little combo victory there but we'll see if that is going to be the case here as we're getting into it you know already generating some clues young wolf's going to come and poke now you have to be mindful about how much extra damage... You, like, you want to put pressure and you want to put a clock on somebody that's playing Death Shadow. But you also have to be careful because they are very happy to have you deal the damage to them so they can be able to just land uh, something quick. Now, great attempt for the Gris. If we can land a Gris, that's going to make a huge difference in this. Being able to have a Planeswalker and have, like, blockers to protect it and just kind of start sniping and killing off annoying pesky big threats like death shadow and stuff like that with the minus ability that would be huge but met with a counter spell so we do see that kind of that plan is shut down for the time being and we're going to be getting ready for our follow-up turn here yeah there we go there's the tap out there's the counter spell what art are you all using for your counter spells do you all have matching art i uh specifically troll people by having different arts for all of my counter spells. Uh, and three out of four of them are white border. So they're all different art. And then one of them is a foil, not white border. Hi, Toby. You want to commentate too? Can you guys hear the cat in the background? It's like every time we start recording a video, she's like, yep, I'm going to tell you what's what. Come around. Uh, Misha's Bobble is our play here. Let's get a cheeky peek at the top of our library um, you can see an archon flicking around in a golgari player's hand uh, that's part of that reanimate package we talked about uh, our little bone friend in there to be able to bring it back so here's death shadow it's simply a 2-2 at the moment because it does get that whole minus uh, it's a 13-13 that gets minus power equal to your life apparently i forgot to put the the card image up for death shadow but that's the namesake of the deck you're kind of Playing the uh, the pain game there of you sitting here and slowly damaging yourself to make this bigger there. But there's the Emperor of Bones. Uh, that's part of the reanimation strategy. But, of course, we, wait, just kidding, maybe, no? Yes, we're going to cast it. Uh, which is going to be met with a counterspell of Drown the Lock. That's the thing. A lot of the Merc Tide, like Demir Merc Tide or Frog Tide lists have started to shave and reduce the number of Drown the Locks to go for other packages. Uh, but... You know, 
losing that is painful, but not you know not the worst that happens. Uh, birthing ritual, of course, going to be coming down. We're looking at our top seven cards, and we're able to sacrifice and trade out one of our creatures for like the plus one converted mana cost so in this case we get rid of our young wolf to get an orcish bowmaster which is really nice to be able to get out knowing that our opponent is making clues they've got you know preordains they're they're going to be sitting here and setting themselves up for a lot of draw potential so that's that's really nice to be able to hit that off of there now on the hunt looking for the orc army the, the downside to the pile of tokens Maybe we'll start forcing people to use uh, infinite tokens uh, if you're on stream. Here you go. Draw this. Probably not, though, because we'd have to just, like, have a dedicated person. Hey, you watch the, the stream and, and make tokens for people. <laughs> draw something cool. Because I am not an artist, and I do not have the art skills to be able to uh, to do very much. A lot of it, if you guys have seen any of the streams that I've guested on for Commander, and I have to draw something, they're all stick figures all the time. All right, polluted delta there. So that's basically just the way you can think about it is fetch and shock lands are just adding more power to the death shadow. So we're debating about the blocks here. Nah, mm, yeah. So there's that back and forth. Are we going to block? Not. It says no. We're not going to block. It changed my mind. So we'll take three life here. Big life swing. But that's also more power to the Death Shadow. So it's a 6-6 six, six at the moment. There's the Dress Down you can see in the library. That Dress Down is really important uh, for a Death Shadow player because it basically just turns your Death Shadow into a straight-up 13-13. I loved running the Grixis version of Death Shadow for a while. Uh, you know, get access to things like lightning bolt but also you get access to things like teamer battle rage which you can just otk somebody the one turn kill hey i'll swing in with this death shadow oh he's got double strike and trample so you're just dead or i could do that on a merc tide and double strike and trample you and, and you're dead not currently running a death shadow list my merc tide is is just the traditional straight up frog tide but i i like every time i see the death shadow list i'm like oh it's so cool it's it's like Big brain thinking about how you want to set everything up here. So Street Wraith also. Street Wraith is dangerous here because we, of course, lose some life to draw a card. But we also are growing the Bowmaster. But yeah, Street Wraith, great to have in here uh, in the list. Draw cards, lose life. It does all the things the Death Shadow wants to do. On over in our Golgari Birthing Ritual player, they're trying to set up for... A big power play here. They're missing a swamp. No Urborg, no other swamp here. Just got Beseju. We got all the green mana for days, right? So we need a Court of Calling. We need something here. So it's like this debate about pushing for damage. We don't actually push for damage, which I think. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like a 2 2, yes, it'll get blocked by the Tameo. The frog could probably just discard and eat something. So I guess the attacks are irrelevant so that you don't actually do anything. And, you know, this also might lead the line of, hey, maybe there is going to be a uh, Court of Calling coming up. There's not. Okay. Oh, here's the other thing. Uh, the player, the Golgari player, prefers to use their Wall of Roots in opposite of what they are played like right you're putting minus o minus one counters on wall of roots the player just tracks it by their toughness this one instead of having five minus one counters and being dead has five toughness and i will slowly take it down and right that's why that one has three on it that other one has five i feel like that's something that a lot of players do when they're first learning and playing the game of like this is how my brain works for tracking this card it has toughness it has less toughness and so i'm going to tick it down instead of having that indication and, and knowledge of the um sorry i think that orc army just grew and wasn't supposed to 
There was a street wraith that was discarded to make the frog bigger here. Eventually, it's going to become bigger because the, the frog's going to hit. But I think it was a 2-2, right? That was the reason why we didn't swing in. Uh, whatever. It, th regardless, the, the point that I was trying to make is a lot of players will track their toughness of stuff based on just like counters, right? Instead of having it as a separate entity of plus one counters or minus one counters or a separate thing that you track using dice compared to its life total, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. In this case, we're at a weekly local event. It's fine, right? You might have issue like at a bigger event, an RCQ or something, if you're playing the deck and tracking it this way. I don't think it would be too much of an issue, though, if you specifically tell your opponent, hey, this is how I'm tracking it, and I'm just going to down tick it this way so it, they are not counters in that regard. Of you know, I don't think players would have too much of an issue, but you know, some people are very particular about their, their stuff here. So pushing damage. So yeah, the Orc Army should be a 3-3. Three, three. Our opponent, uh, like our deck player is at two, so it could be really relevant here of the the army getting bigger. We'll see, though. There's another frog, so we're going hellbent. Lots of blockers here just in case something gets crazy. But there could just be a combo win if we have a court of calling and are able to start setting something up. Like, I don't know if the Birthing Ritual player is running, like, a one of Sheldred in the main board. I was for the longest time with my Birthing Ritual list. It's just, like, a here's one Sheldred in here that I could tutor for for just if I'm playing against players that are drawing a bunch of cards. This is really relevant and helpful, just like the, uh, you know, uh, Orcish Bowmasters are. All right, going through. I think there was that big old discussion of, I just need a, a another black source here. I'm I'm stuck. Push for damage, but it will just get eaten by the uh, death shadow. So there's no point pushing damage here. But set up here, go to end step. What was that? Two chords in there. Malevolent rumble. Yeah, not not happening. So game one goes to our death shadow player here, and we will be jumping over into sideboards, looking for things that will help protect us. Hoping for a better mana base going into it. I don't know. I like I like both these decks. I Yogmoth has fallen down a little bit more on the power scale of things. Not necessarily power scale, but like it's not as strong as it once was. So of course going to be Yep. Mulliganing down to six, putting that on the bottom. And ready to go for game number two. Yeah, let me know what you guys think about the banner. Do you want to keep the banner at the bottom of the screen with all the information? Do you want to have it up at the top of the screen? Where would you guys like to have that? A bobble to start. Let's do a cheeky peek. Now, the discussion question comes about who do you hit with the bobble? If you're going to be going for like your own plays and trying to debate about like, oh, I have a fetch land. I have a preordain. I have these setup cards that maybe getting more information about what is available could be useful to you. If you have a thought seize, if you have an inquisition, you're always going to want to bobble your opponent before you hit them with a inquisition or a thought seize. That way you have the as much information as possible going, okay, what are you rocking? What do you have over here? How How is things set up for you? Like, even in this case where your opponent is going to be doing some surveilling, like, you could even wait and bobble them and get some more information and, and draw some cards then, but we'll see. All right, so the Bowmaster just, like, coming out. Let's get a thread out. I am hesitant on the, like, main phase Bowmaster. I mean, you kind of like know that a bowmaster is coming, though. If you if you go, all right, here's my land. Pass turn. I have no young wolf, no uh, mana dork, no nothing. Then you like, okay, well, you have a bowmaster, but it could, you know, bait your opponent into that false sense of security of them being like, here's a preordain, here's a street wraith, here's a bobble, and you go in response, I'll flash in a bowmaster to get basically an extra bonus damage to you. That's not going to be the case by playing it this way. It now becomes kind of that deterrent and this like, okay, the information is available to you. 
do you feel like it's acceptable to take extra damage to draw cards now? All right, And it might make your opponent now more hesitant, more resistant to playing that preordain in their hand or playing that street wraith knowing that they don't have a way to deal with it but we're on the reactionary death shadow plan now is like okay we're just going to take some damage try to deal with our opponent here there's an overgrown so we do have access to our double black that we didn't last turn and a grist hungering tide do we've got a counter spell if even if we did we don't have the double blue for it so we do have fatal push though to get rid of the orcish bowmaster here but this is a dangerous spot we do not have very efficient planeswalker removal other than through combat and having a gris resolve stay out making a insect we've got basically the way to shoot down any creature that comes on out so we do see a little bit of a sideboard card here is this shadow of doubt unless you run a one of main board which is very possible some players list you know do that with the amount of searching that is happening here but drown the lock is nice a dorothy void walker it's this weird awkward spot right again any threat that gets played immediately dies so it's the question of i need to progress my game plan here but doing so would also put me behind like if you have follow-ups for it like that would be very very helpful but going on the draw compared to the play you're you're kind of on the back foot so keeping the mana available to respond here makes sense also if you know next turn you have four mana that you can do a little bit more but the more that the you know gris gets scarier and scarier the harder it's going to be right five loyalty every turn it's got that chance to just kind of pop something really and continue to make a swarm of insects or in this case a fish a soldier but this is that scary part of the larger the creature count gets, the scarier the Court of Calling gets. Shadow of Doubt is perfect response to that, but we can't just kind of fall behind on what we're trying to do. So there's a Bowmaster attempt to cast, which where our Drown the Lock will be beneficial. Let's just kind of hit that with the counter. Get that out of here. I like the swamp choice here. All right, another fatal push. Again, this uh, that's the downside to the deck, right? We need a Sheldred's Edict or something like that. Uh, I don't know if our Death Shadow player is running them in their list. I had at least a one of main board and a one of sideboard. Because it's really hard to answer Planeswalkers. And, like, you have a lot of counterspell. You have a lot of removal for creatures. But once a Planeswalker sticks, it becomes really tough. So we're not going to take any extra life off of it. Because we're... I don't know. You have the... It's like, at some point, you have to you have to do something, right? So we're going to do the Dothy here. Which is really good, right? Dothy is often a sideboard card, but it works out really well against a Yawgmoth player of them trying to be able to do some undying stuff, and they will not be able to, right? That is not a line that they get access to with Dothy out. But that immediately gets uh, eaten up by Gris, and we're going to be following up with the Malevolent Rumble, which, uh, you know, this card's amazing. Every time you see this card, you it does work, right? Find a permanent, make an Eldrazi spawn, in this case a plant, and we're going to be looking through, see a little bit of sideboard stuff here, Veil of Summer, but we cannot take Veil of Summer, we can only take a permanent, so we're going to be going with our delighted halfling, just in the off chance that our opponent tries to counter one of our legendary stuff, like Yawgmoth, we have a way to, to stop them, and we're going to pop that Eldrazi spawn to be able to cast the Malevolent Rumble Part 2. So there is another Yog Moth here. There's a young wolf. Uh, but we go with our Dryad Arbor. I love the white border. Look at that. Oh, it's so good. Ultimate tilt factor there, right? You're going, hey, here's this 1-1 one, one, uh, Dryad Arbor forest. Can't tap for mana immediately. It is a creature. Um, so that is a, a nice little thing to just kind of be like, all right, there's my land. I'll have four lands available. 
go for uh, some combat here, and we're going to just shoot and pop that one Dryad Arbor just to kind of make sure our opponent is lower on the mana count. And, and I mean, that's one thing that we have going for us as a Death Shadow player is we're keeping them in check. We're, but the problem is the Golgari Birthing Ritual player is just like they're ahead and they're continuing to get more ahead. Uh, there's a Street Wraith, there's an Inquisition, let's see what we've got. We've got Yogma. we've got a Court of Calling, we've got a Geralt's Messenger, we've got a Delighted Halfling. So Geralt's Messenger cannot be cast yet because there's only two black sources. But if a third one showed up, that would be scary. Um, you could strip one of the cord, or you could strip the cord or something, but I, I don't know. That's I think Geralt's Messenger is fine to get rid of. All right, there's the Delighted. Again, the anti-countering is really nice. Birthing Ritual. Let's start turning these insects into something of value, shall we? I'm interested, like, I've been attempting to do some Birthing Ritual shenanigans here and there. A big part of mine is, like, trying to find the right numbers of three drops and, and two drops and everything. Yes, the Shadow of Doubt responds to Court of Calling. You cannot search your library, and I get a draw card. I love it. It's one, I, every time that, sh like, Shadow of Doubt happens and, like, stops somebody from fetching, stops someone from using cord, I'm, like, all in. I'm like, yes, that card is doing everything that I want it to do. Love to see it. All right, what do we got here? Zulaport Cutthroat, Young Wolf. So we could sacrifice our Halfling for a two drop or just get rid of one of ours to get a one drop, which, yeah, that seems good. Because we've got Yawgmoth next turn. Or the attempt to, to play Yawgmoth next turn. Again, Grist is just running away with the game. Here's a Thought Seize. And now we can be able to strip away Yawgmoth here. And follow it up with a Murktide. Now we're Hellbent, though. So no cards left in hand. We know Murktide's going to get popped. Tough, tough position to be in. Yeah. Minus two, get rid of your Murktide. Send the team and go to end step. That's the fun part of Birthing Ritual is just the amount of cards that you get to look through here. All right, so we've got two young wolves out now. One card in hand, but we're going to scoop it up there, tying it up. One, one, the kind of... Gris run away with the game worked out great here. So we've got things lining up here. Lots of sideboard cards for our birthing ritual player. Savage summoning in here, kind of the anti uh, counterable side of things for creatures. Uh, Veil of Summer is there. The downside to this hand is you have a, a Dryad Arbor in your hand. I never, ever, ever want to see a Dryad Arbor in my opening hand. I always mulligan those hands. And this is just because your mana base gets wonky. It puts you at risk. Yeah, you've got a lot of ramp. I can see why you want to keep this. Because, you like, assuming Dryad Arbor is, is good to go, you're you're good, right? You let it be able to hang out there, and you're, you're fine. Um, looking at the Savage Summoning, but really we care more about the Veil of Summer here. Because it stops the Inquisitions, it stops the targeted removal spells, so that's going to get stripped away here at, at our start for game number three. Now we're past turn over. Of course, we do have that Bobble trigger that will be able to allow us to draw a card. Bobble, of course, was looking at our opponents, so that helped us out of just get as much information about what's in the hand, what's on the top of their library, and we're basically looking at eight cards and trying to determine what's the best way to do it. And look at this Drown in the Lock. Popping your Dryad Arbor. And if you know that your opponent doesn't have a good follow-up based on what card was on top of their library, you're kind of feeling really good about that, that snipe there. 
So Young Wolf comes out. Our Birthing Ritual players is looking to be able to get just one more land and start to go with Wall of Roots and really kind of ramp up and get going. But this is that difference, right? We saw how, like, okay, you're on the draw compared to the play. How impactful that is in modern in the current day and, and like, going to be stripping away more. Hey, I'm going to be on the play so I can do a much more reactionary and disrupt and We've talked about this before on the channel of if you're playing against combo decks, how do you fight them? One way is to be able to try to disrupt their combo and disrupt the cards that are in their hand using things like Inquisitions, Thought Seas, disrupt their graveyards, being able to use things like um, our Beseju, being able to do things like um, do Dothy Voidwalker, Surgical Extractions. You know, you can do all these different things to disrupt what your opponent is trying to trying to do. Uh, Surveil Land is going to come out. We do have two Young Wolves still missing that second land right now. And that's kind of that risk of being like, ah, I'll be all right. I got two lands. But you also don't really have two lands in how vulnerable Dry Arbor is. And we saw it when you're fighting against a deck that is like so much removal available to it. All right, where are we following it? Up here, preordain. let's do some setup. Scry to draw a card. There's the Lord of the Rings preordain art there. Interesting. All right, so one of those cards we just put on the bottom was our dress down so I personally like having that on top um, if our opponent tr attempts to do some comboing dress down stops them from doing that right young wolves no longer have undying uh, yogmoth no longer has any ability to do any sacrificing or doing things so like it's a it's almost like a protection spell it replaces itself. It also can help us win the game if we have a Death Shadow. But I can see why you might want to move it to the bottom. But it's still like, I don't know. It's almost like a safety net with having Dress Down available. Especially because we are already ahead. And it just kind of is that like win more or stop our opponent from, from being able to do something that crazy that could have them come back here. There's another preordain. I like the retro art for it. Both on the bottom there. We weren't happy with either of those. Oh, a Dothy, though. Now, jamming a Dothy here is n possible, but we also have two Drown in the Locks. So it's like, do we basically put a stop to the young wolf stuff? Or do we utilize our Drown the Lock so if our opponent gets two mana, we just stop whatever they try to do? Immediately just hit it with the counter spell. All right, put a counter on our frog, and then we're going to be getting ourselves set up here and ready to go for the flying frog. Which is very nice. Get some damage, draw a card. Pink, pink, pink. Two damage. Okay, there's a cord here. See, that's the other thing. You could cord for Dryad Arbor if Dryad Arbor was in your library. Like, if you were hurting this bad and being like, ah, I kept a one lander for some reason, and you're like, well, I can cord here at least. But no, we're just going to push damage and pass. Which, when you think about the clock... And how much life is left, 9 life to 15, is pretty good until a Death Shadow lands. And then you go, all that work that I did just was for naught, right? They're they're sitting here, and they're set up and ready to just kill me with one big scary creature. Uh, Murktide coming down. That is a problem. Uh, lots of stuff has been in the graveyard so far. And Murktide is going to be sitting here. Lots of counters on it. We also have our frog out. So that means that when we make our frog fly, 
that means that the Merc Tide is just going to get even bigger. So right now it's an 8-8. Frog deal, was able to deal 2 damage. Play a land. Pass turn. Yeah, so there's 10 damage on the board right now. We don't have a Gris. We don't have any way to really stop our opponent here. Do some fetching. And yeah, we're doing some math real quick. This is okay. Based on what is here, nothing. I got nothing. There's nothing that I can do to, to kind of come out on there. And I don't know. Game three was a lot of just the, the dry at Arbor Keep. I... I understand when you have a hand that's like, I got a bunch of cyborg cards. These are amazing. They do so well. But you just get blown out, and then you're left sad. I don't know. Dryad Arbor, don't keep in your opening hand. That's That was our, our lesson for today, y'all. Don't do that. But that's going to do it for today's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed our excellent modern action. But... Keep an eye out every Monday and Thursday for more modern action. But that's going to do it. Thanks so much for tuning in and watching, everybody. And I'll see you all next game.